will turn with us to the book of Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, and we want to re begin reading verse 1. We have a long uh, text this morning, but to get everything that he says in this, we want to read down through verse 20. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1 through 20, as we begin. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth any usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, even hath eaten upon the mountains, and hath defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, and hath taken all his hand from the poor that hath not received uh, usury nor increase, I uh, have executed my judgments, have walked in my statutes, he shall not die. For the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet ye say, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, we want to look particularly at verse 4 and take our thought here and then develop this through what was said in this chapter and some other verses. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, he mentioned here a proverb. 
Proverbs says, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. And evidently from the context, there was an idea. Now, prevalent upon the false premise which perverted their outlook on life and toward God. And God would not let this false premise go unchallenged. We see from the context here they believe that if the father did evil, the son would also be punished. God saying not so. He said, all souls are mine. And this is one of the things that we need to see. That each one of us individually is accountable to God for our own choices and actions. If we do that which is good and right, we will be blessed regardless of what our parents did or didn't do. Or what our children do or don't do. And if we do that which is wrong, God will judge us. As a child of God, He'll chastise us. But one of the things that we see here is how people apply this to salvation. And I don't think He's talking about salvation here. Israel as a nation, as a people, had sinned and gone away from God. And they were carried into captivity as a result. And I believe, as we were from our study, that uh, the prophet Ezekiel was a prophet of the captivity. And this is part of the background and context for what he is saying. There were many of the children of Israel, the seed of Abraham, that perished when the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took the people captive. Many perished. And many lived. And were taken into captivity. Daniel was one of those who was taken into captivity. Daniel prayed and, and confessed his sins, and he included and said, We have sinned. Anyway, that was part of the context for what God is saying here uh, in Ezekiel. And so he sets the spiritual record straight in uh, verse 20. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. So those that do righteous will be treated accordingly. Those who do wickedly will be treated accordingly. Uh, verse 25 said, Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? God is saying, it is your mindset, it is your way of thinking, it is your idea of equality or what's fair that is wrong. See, that was the premise behind that proverb that was quoted. The fathers eat sour grapes and their children reap the consequences. Is basically what it's saying. And God says that's not so. Two things. Each will bear the responsibility and accountability for their own actions and choices. Verse 20. And God is just and righteous in all of His judgment. Man's ways are not equitable or right, which He puts forth in 
verse 25. Notice, if you will, Genesis 18.25. This was in the context of Abraham talking to the angel of the Lord that announced the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham understood. And shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That is something that we need to wrap our minds around and understand and grasp the very nature and essence of God. Not only is He the Almighty and is able to do whatever He wants to do, but by His very nature, He is holy, He is righteous, He is good. And so whatever His judgments may be, Whatever His plan, His purpose, His ways may be, we can be assured that they are right, they are just, they are fair. See, sometimes our idea of fairness comes from a sinful nature. God's understanding and idea of fairness comes from a holy nature. That is why he declares that my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways and my thoughts, they're higher. They're above your thoughts and your ways. We may not always understand why God does some things. We may have a questions about it. But one thing we ought never to question is, is it right? Is it just? Is it equitable? If God has said it, it is. The judge of all the earth shall do right. Notice also Psalm 119. This Psalm of Psalms. And there's several verses because the whole song focuses upon the Word. And there's many different terms used that you'll find here. His Word, His Law, His Statutes, His Precepts, His Commandments. All these different terms in relationship to the Word of God and different aspects of the Word of God he expounds on here in the 119th Psalm, verse 128. He says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. So anyway, any idea, any teaching that is contrary to the precepts of God is false. The psalm says, All thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Uh, verse 138 Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Uh, 142 Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Verse 160. 
Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Shall not the judge of all the earth do that which is right? Of course. Then how can we say the way of the Lord is not equitable? It is not fair. Well, Proverbs 14, 12 Notice what it says. There is a way which seemeth right unto man. The end thereof are the ways of death. Now, obviously, it seemed to the Jews, or the Hebrews, the children of Israel, to whom Ezekiel is, God is using Ezekiel to speak to, in their way of thinking, God was not fair. They thought that they were right. They said the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 30 and verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. You know, they, they disagreed with God and they thought they were right. Paul said, who are thou that repliest against your maker? Well, yeah, that's, that's what the fall depravity of our nature, sin, how it affects our thinking. That we think that we can correct God, that we can find fault with Him and correct Him and tell Him His mistake and He should listen to us. Now how foolish is that? You know, that is one of the things with Job had his questions. And he went through all the book of Job. And then God begins to speak and talk to Job. And he takes him back. What does he do? He takes him through the creation. Now, were you there when I did this? Did I need your counsel, your advice to do these things? That's what he takes him back through and he reminds him, who are you talking to? I do not have to give an account to you for what I do. I don't have to justify. It is for you to understand that the God of all the earth will do right. And Job, he's, I, I spoke about things I didn't, didn't, know, didn't understand. I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> yeah. That phrase, you know, he put his hand over his mouth, was, he was going to shut up. He was speaking out of turn, and he realized, he's talking about things he didn't understand. And he said, I'm going to shut up before I get myself into more trouble. Um... Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So when we compare the, the mind, the understanding, the rationale of man to that of God, whom are we going to trust more? That's what John says over in, in 1 John chapter 5. We receive the witness of men. The witness of God is greater Every soul belongs to God and will give an account to God. He said, all souls are mine. Now, in the context, in, in particular, he's talking about the soul of the Father and the soul of the Son. So they're both mine. I'll do with each as I please. Not according to what you think I ought to do. But I will deal with each according to my judgment. 
And that goes for every one of us. Each one of us as an individual, our soul belongs to God. It's not ours. If you stop and think about it. We, we think, well, I'm my own man. I, I, you know, I've got free will. I've got you know, judgment. But where did that come from? In the beginning, God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Where did that life come from? Where did that soul come from? God gave it to him. That's when God said, it's mine. And that soul has to give an account. It's accountable to its creator who made and gave it. All souls are mine. And the soul that sinned shall die. It's part of the problem. Well, we read in the New Testament in the book of Romans, Three verses here, we're going to go backwards. We're going to start in Romans chapter 6, then go to Romans chapter 5, and then to Romans chapter 3. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. And then what God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin <coughs> entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Let that think, sink in for me, because, I'm going to have to break in a new Bible. <laughs> I came all the way loose there. This one is converting itself into a loose leaf Bible. <laughs> Man has the notion of himself, the perspective of himself. I am a good person. And so they think, therefore, I ought to live. I ought to have eternal life. I ought to live with God through eternity because I am a good person. I said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And I said, when sin came into this world through Adam's disobedience, he passed that on. And it's not that men <coughs> are condemned because of what Adam did. Notice what it says. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The sentence of death is passed because we have sinned. Not because Adam sinned, but because we sinned. Now in Adam, Adam fell, he lost that state of innocence. And that is what was passed on to us and to all his posterity is a sin nature. But we are not condemned because Adam sinned. We are condemned because we have sinned. Romans 6.23 All have sinned. Or, excuse me, Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we see that I will come back to more of Romans chapter 3. But um, like many people today, the Israelites had the wrong way of thinking of sin the law and their own righteousness 
and how that affects our standing and relationship to God. We see verses 5 through 20, God is demonstrating that the judgment, condemnation, or reward of one generation for its actions is not passed against the next. And he said, either the reward or the, the condemnation. What this generation or this individual does, the reward for that or the condemnation for that is not passed on to the son or to the posterity. But that generation or that individual will bear the condemnation or reward for their own actions. Now why is that important? Well, as we see in the days of Israel, they had a misconception. When the Pharisees and all were challenged because they did not think they had sinned. They were not sinners like these other folks were. And when they were challenged, what did they say? We be the seed of Abraham. Abraham is our father. Okay. But how does what Abraham did make you just? There is very prominently in what we would call the Protestant covenant theology, Calvinism, Presbyterianism, and different branches of that, maybe even Lutheranism, the idea that because the parents are Christians, children born to Christian parents are under the covenant. Now why should that be? See, that's that thinking. And so they do that to justify the infant baptism and making them members of that universal church. They're under the covenant. Because they were born to Christian parents. That's the very type of thinking that God is rebuking here in Ezekiel. Um, we see in the scriptures that individuals are saved when they hear and understand the gospel repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They then can articulate that faith and confess before witnesses that faith before they are baptized. That is the New Testament pattern. Uh, in Romans chapter 10, which begins with pointing out the error of the, uh, Israel, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and, see, and that's what Ezekiel is pointing out here, God's, God is righteous. And His judgments are right and good and just and fair. And they didn't think so. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Now anytime people begin to argue with what God says in His Word, they're not submitting themselves to the righteousness or the righteous judgments of God. First of all, you need to be sure that we're correctly and rightly dividing the word of truth. But uh, he said, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Verse 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, the infant can't do that. And just because the infant's parents were Christians and made a profession of faith doesn't make them Christians. One of the things that we see, even in the Old Testament, over in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, this is when Ezra, they gathered all the people together and he read the law. Now notice verse 2. Well, let's begin with verse 1. Nehemiah 8, 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and notice, so of men and women, what's left? Children? And all that could hear with understanding. All that could hear with understanding. And so, that's important. Secondly, God demonstrates that a person is saved by grace through faith and not by works of the law. Verses 21 through 24. He says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Now, he gives us two examples here. That, that was example number one. He said, all his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all in the wick, that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that they should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed, and his, his sin that he has sinned, and then shall he die. Now, to understand, I believe, what God is saying here, now he puts forth two. There's the one who starts out on the path of sin but repents and begins to do that which is right and good. The one who is counted as righteous but turns from the righteous path to sin. God says the first shall live but the other shall die. Now notice in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus sets forth a parable. And I think understanding this parable, because what is Jesus doing? He is correcting the false thinking of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders that He is confronting. Who are thinking much like the people Ezekiel is confronting here in His day. And so... Jesus speaks a parable unto them. And this was in the context, context that they asked him, by what authority are you teaching these things? And Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. You answer my question and I'll answer yours. The baptism of John, what was it? Was it of men or is it of God? And of course, you know, they're, they're thinking that, and they said, well, we can't answer that. He said, well, then I can't tell you by what authority I'm doing what I'm doing either. And then he said this parable to them. Verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to 
The second said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? He said, which one of these two sons actually did the will of the father? They said, well, the first one. And that was right. And then he takes and applies it to them. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. In other words, so he is making the application here. Those who society recognize as sinners, those who recognize themselves as sinners, those who had been taught the Word of God and said, we will not do that. And yet at the preaching of John, they repented and they began to bring forth fruits meet for repentance. And he said, you wouldn't do it. You rejected it. You who had said in the beginning, we're going to keep the law. We're going to obey God. And counted yourselves as righteous. You see, but you have sinned. Now, one of the things the scriptures brings out, and it, this is the principle. I believe that Ezekiel is bringing up, and understand these people thought they were righteous, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to their established their own righteousness, they had not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And in their eyes they were righteous. Because, uh, the a great example, the Pharisee and the publican in the temple praying, the Pharisee said, you know, I thank God I'm not like these other people because I tithe and I, you know, I do this and I do that. There, and there were some things he was doing that was right. But there were some things he was doing that was wrong too. And the principle is, I believe, uh, let me catch up in my notes, if I can. James chapter 2, verse 10. For well, whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. See, they didn't understand that. You can be a good neighbor. You can go through life and never steal. Never murder anybody. To the best of your knowledge, not harm anybody. But does that make give you a righteousness that is acceptable to God that you should live forever? No, because have you ever told a lie? Of course you have. Isn't that one of the commandments? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not lie. The law. It doesn't say the laws, plural. It says the law. And if we're going to be righteous by keeping the law, you must keep the whole law perfectly. And if you fail in any one point, no matter how much good you have done, you fail in any one point, that is sin and that is sufficient to condemn you. And that's what the Jews are saying, that's not fair. God said, every soul, it belongs to me, and my righteous judgment is that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. If you sin, I, no matter how much righteousness you do, he said, that righteousness won't take away that sin and won't be counted. In the end, it is the sin that will condemn you. That's why Jesus Christ came, and he died to take away our sin. And at the preaching of the gospel, those who repent 
and turn from their wicked ways. For the Pharisees, as Paul did, that is to count all that before he had thought of as making him righteous and good and acceptable to God, he counted as dung that he might win Christ. He repented of all of that. And he trusted Christ. And that is what we are to do. Those who repent of their sins and believe on Christ are forgiven. And the righteousness of God is imputed to them by faith and their sin is not charged to them. And that what he says in Ezekiel? You know, when you read that in, in the Old Testament and you're thinking of it in an Old Testament context, sometimes it doesn't make sense. But when you compare that to the New Testament, it begins to make sense. In um, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, now let's see. No, Romans chapter 4. Because I'm skipping over some of this. I am losing my place in my notes. Romans chapter 4. We've come through Romans chapter 3. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good, no, not one. None that doeth good. Uh, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 3. Chapter 4, verse 3. What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Now notice, he justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now no, who's saying this? David. Old Testament. This Old Testament doctrine is also a New Testament doctrine. David is quoted and used to prove the point Paul is making to New Testament believers. Whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Isn't that exactly what he said over in Ezekiel? So you see what God was talking about in Ezekiel. You that think that you are righteous because you keep the law, if you offend at one point, that sin is what's going to condemn you. All of the good things that you did don't count. Because if you break it at one point, you're guilty of all of it. You are a lawbreaker. You broke the law. And are condemned. But if you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, His righteousness, which is a perfect righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is imputed to us by faith, and that all the sin that we did is not charged to our account because we repented. And the righteousness of God is imputed to us by faith. That's the reason Ezekiel in verse 32, the end of that chapter. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. In other words, repent and live. That is his admonition. All souls are mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Let us stand.